Hello, and welcome to Backstage Banter, supported by MTC major partner, ANZ. My name is Chris Mead, and I'm the literary director here at Melbourne Theatre Company. Joining me online today, we have five phenomenal actors who will attempt to answer some of your questions and give an insight or two into their process, career highlights, and potentially a backstage secret or three. Joining me today, we have Fiona Choi, who has appeared in MTC productions such as Golden Shield, The Lady in the Van, and this year's Torch the Place. Nadine Garner has appeared on stage for MTC in numerous productions, most recently Emerald City and Photograph 51. Louise Siverson last graced the MTC stage in the hilarious Noises Off, along with being in Joanna Murray Smith's True Minds and Robert Reed's The Joy of Text. Michael Varr most recently stole the hearts of many as the dashing William Shakespeare in the MTC production of Shakespeare in Love. And Isabella Yenna joins us after a sensational MTC main stage debut in Home I'm Darling. Hey, hello everyone. Welcome, welcome. It's <laughs> lovely to see your faces. Now, we've had plenty of great questions sent in for you to answer. We'll do our best, but to kick off, let's think a little bit about the time that we've had. Let's look backwards. Let's turn inwards momentarily. As we're living through this pandemic and theatres across the country are sitting dark, it's been an opportunity for a lot of people to reflect, to think about what we do, why it is that we do what we do, why we love doing what we do, and how we can't wait to get back. So with all of that in mind, the first question is, when did you know that you have wanted to get into acting? Fiona. Let's start with you. Well, I uh, I grew up in love with uh, watching Hollywood mu musicals and the old movies on uh, Bill Collins' Golden Years of Hollywood, and um, and I used to go to bed on a Saturday night, and then um, when my parents thought I was asleep, I'd sneak back out into the into the living room and quietly turn on the television and fantasize about being in a Hollywood movie. So um, probably I was five. <laughs> Five or six, um, that was it for me. It was so glamorous. But um, but then, I, uh, and then a, a short while after that, I just I I realized it was more than just the surface glamour, and um, and I loved the idea of being able to put on a whole other life, a whole other character, and uh, and experience and communicate to the world in that way. So, for me, I did dance as a child and sort of fell in love with performing that way. Um, but didn't continue it on until I went to high school and then just started doing the school productions um, and re-fell in love with performing. But I didn't know, I didn't realise acting was a career. I didn't, I didn't know you could do that until, until I was like 18. I didn't, I never thought that I would be someone who did it. That was for other people. Um, but sort of discovered it and then pursued it and um, in doing it. So. <laughs> I think I got into storytelling or listening to a lot of storytelling as a child with a lot of audiobooks. Um, I, I was lucky enough to be taken to the theatre a lot as a kid as well. So there was very much the, the live performance aspect of seeing it and the, and the magic of, of theatre. I remember seeing a, a production of, of Othello um, and getting to meet the actor after the show. And as like wow. a six-year-old or seven-year-old, mm -hmm. something I was enamoured by how he was able to, how he didn't hurt himself with the knife. <laughs> and it was this retractable on stage and, you know, <laughs> the meeting and going like, wow, I, and he went to, you know, show, look, it's it's easy, it's fine, it doesn't hurt you. And I was so tiny and frail that it, it, <laughs> it kind of did. Um, and then but just seeing this absolute... Um, the, the 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 magic of the curtain as a kid and and you know going to bed listening to tales of you know famous five of Eden Blyton or Faraway Tree or the Goons or or Star Wars or it, it was a place where anything could come alive and seeing it on stage was inspiring and, and I you know started to muck around as kids and you know play with lightsabers at home and create stories and and then that evolved into it being natural progressively through school and then universities and, and industry. 
And how about you, Nadine? A bit like Michael, I grew up luckily in a house where stories were told, albeit they were very um, traditional stories, Beatrix Potter and Inner Blighton and stuff, stuff that now we probably don't pass on so readily to our kids, but that's what was available to me. So I was definitely, you know, my curiosity was galloping and off and running by the time I was sort of four and five, and then I entered the world of calisthenics, which is also... <laughs> <laughs> unmentionable kind of institution <laughs> but, uh, I got quite badly bitten by the performing bug of you know the kind of leotards competition and I, my mum wasn't the stage mum at all she was like ah oh, she wants to do this thing and I've got to drive her to here and <laughs> <laughs> um, some of those kids who was like right what do we have to do let's get out and do it so it started quite early for me um and then uh I also ended up doing dance classes and then I went to you know, mum took me to see musicals and, and things like that and, and, and productions at the NTC and I was like, oh, yeah, that, that thing on the stage where I loved the ritual of it, I loved the smell of theatres, I loved the whole sense of going into a theatre. I my, The hair on the back of my neck would stand on end and it was just a thing. I was like, I want to be part of that world. Whatever that is, I'm getting in there somehow. <laughs> so I didn't really know how that was going to happen either but you know, things happen and luckily I was afforded the opportunity. So I feel very privileged though as a, you know, white middle-class person that those things were available to me, yeah. Again, uh, dancing, classical ballet, and love that whole world of being, you know, backstage, getting ready, going out, the whole kind of nervous thing. Uh, and then I started taking... Um, uh, lessons at school and did in those days you could do um competitions <laughs> and i remember winning five dollars for a mime competition and thinking like, <laughs> <laughs> says, yeah bring it on <laughs> and then, um, you look a yeah, yeah, exactly <laughs> and then i went to see marcel marceau my mother took me, <laughs> and i was i don't know i was a you know i'm a really small person and the only person in there um, alone and just thought, this is unbelievable. We're in the dark and everybody's together and we're all believing the one thing. I just thought that that was something incredible. So I think that kind of just became a place for me where I felt happy and well. It was the means by which I could be somebody else um, and leave you know, any trouble or any other kind of um, obstacle behind and just become this other person. And for that period of time, I was free and it, and it gave me that feeling of floating or being underwater and it was quiet. And I just loved it and it's still the same for me. That's a fantastic segue. Thanks, Lou. To a question from Kerry who asks, how do you get into character? Do you need to have some personal connection? Is it about floating? Is it about being underwater? What allows you to empathise with that character? Okay, Michael, how about you? It's, each character, it feels like it changes from character to character. Um, certainly show to show is very different um, for a lot of people, uh, a lot of performers, um, whether you're on film, TV, stage, you might be in a different theatre, um, different period, different style, different costume. Um, and so I find that that's, it's, it's almost like a, a problem solving or a choose your own adventure on how, how you get there, um, whether you, you find it something in the costume. Um, the senses are always amazing, um, whether it's tangible or, or smell or um, a sight or a sound, music, um, I, I think, uh, you know, I don't want to speak for anyone else, but it, it really varies for me from character to character and that's part of the joy in, in opening up and discovering and doing justice to a character, fictitious or, or from the past or, or present. Fee, I might throw to you here only because of your recent experience, very recent experience of having just done Torch the Place. Given that you already have enormous amounts of experience working on Ben's writing, but you played a completely different character on the TV show to then being in the play. You went from mother to daughter in terms of going from one character but being in the same universe of writing. How was that experience for you? 
It, it, it really did spin me out at first, actually, especially because uh, the character that I play in the on the stage show, Torch the Place, which is the daughter character, had to actually interact so closely with, you know, the character that I have often uh, played a lot, uh, the mum character. So it was a little bit of a spin out, but uh, but I always just start with myself, you know, and uh, because, I mean, that's how characters connect anyway, like they they're trying to find common ground. So I always, um, I always just start with myself and then uh, figure out how I would, how I would feel about this particular arc and storyline and everything. And then I, and then I look out and, and do a whole lot of um, noticing characters in the world and uh, which ones or on television, on, on film, uh, but even real people. Um, I based, when I played Jenny Law, Benjamin's mum in The Family Law, that whole character was based, it was based on his mum, but I actually created her by paying um, tribute to my mum. So it was very much like that. And um, and I think when it came time to have to play the flip side, the daughter, well, I almost feel like um, because Benjamin and I had already worked so closely together. He pretty much wrote it with me in mind. So it wasn't really too different from it was written to be played by someone that's exactly has my sort of experience and is my age and background and uh, and inserts herself into the family in that way. So, um, But in general, um, I always love to know what shoes the character is wearing um, when I put on their shoes, suddenly I know, you know, and I work a lot with experimenting with different shoes. Uh, <laughs> I know how a character stands and walks and, uh, and physically, uh, you know, uh, owns their space. Thanks so much for that, Fiona. I might go to Nadine here. We did a workshop uh, a couple of weeks back uh, and Nadine, you said something moving, genuinely moving and quite chilling. Uh, about working in character and the cost to you as an actor for working in character and how a particular character you played, that that she stayed with you and her experiences stayed with you, um, that you're possessed uh, by that character, you immerse yourself in that character um, and it takes you a while to leave that character behind. So the question is, Nadine, what's your particular journey of getting into and perhaps out of character. That's true for me. I mean, I, and, and it's true of what everyone else has said too in regards to building character, and it's a very personal thing. Some actors don't even like to talk about it, I guess. I think coming to character is really personal, but there are some roles that I, I look at with trepidation because I know, I know how it's going to be to carry them and I know how it's going to be to carry their grief or their trauma and I think because we know so no, know so much more about um, neuro, neuroplasticity and the fact that we are actually rewiring our brain when we become a character, that we actually are a host to that entity. And it's a really big responsibility we take on psychologically and emotionally to host that person and whatever trauma or whatever their emotional life is. And I was talking to Chris and, and a group the other day about um, a play called The Weir, a kind of haunting Irish play and I had this sort of four-page monologue about watching my daughter drown. And um, it was just one of those roles I didn't recover from that, that well, well, to be honest. I, I kind of took that neurosis into my life and became sort of pathological about the safety of my second-born child. And it took me probably about four years <laughs> to really get my head around it, you know, because I had built some really strong networks in my brain that were telling me that my my child wasn't safe and I was doing that eight times a week. So I learned a lot about the frailties of the human psyche and I tread very carefully now when I say yes to plays because I'm aware of the, the incantation of, of what we do. You know, we, we sort of summons things um, ritualistically when we perform things eight times a week and when we step into that content, we need to be mindful of the power that creates for, for us and also the audience around us. So, that may sound a little bit uh, like witchy poo talk, but for me it's true and, and for me it feeds into 
um, the kind of uh, importance and, and power that we have as performers and receivers, that we're, we're doing something quite important and the messaging and the spirituality of that piece will have repercussions on everyone and are we all okay with what they are? Isabella? I really resonate with what both Michael and Fee said. Um, for me, it depends on, you know, the, the time period, the time and place I find I really get a lot from. So um, I love working on the set, whatever that is. I find, like, I feel grounded and placed once I'm or I have something to play with. And costume as well I find really informative, how you walk, what shoes you're wearing. Um, and in terms of time period or era I find really interesting because it does dictate often behaviours and how, how you respond to people, how I or the character is in relation to other people. What are the customs, what are the, you know, policies and responsibilities that they have within that I find I, I get really lost in that kind of world and that that research and that I, I love I love that that's one of the parts that I love about acting the, the rehearsal is just like delicious <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much Isabella that's beautiful uh which takes us from beauty to a darker place perhaps and I don't want you to mention any names but it, Stephanie has a question a tough question Stephanie asks have you ever been in a situation no names no names remember but have you ever been in a situation where you feel a character needs to be portrayed in a particular way, but the director has other ideas? I guess I haven't, I haven't got a glory story, but it's, it's, I do love the, the wrestle with, with the director. Like I haven't, I'm not sitting outside watching and I'm not, you know, fitting all the things together with lighting and sound and I'm not going to be where the audience is as much as I can imagine it to try and tell the story. And so that sense of trust with a director and a, and a, and a performer is, is important for me. And I think there are times when that, that certainly can change or you need to earn it back or find it back on both sides um, because at the end of the day we're all trying to tell the same story even if we're doing it eight times, eight times a week or, you know, there in the editing suite for months on end afterward. But it's... it's that wrestle, like the, I love that the term theatre means argument. And so in each sense, you know, back in the English theatre, um, back in the day, and so like should we go see the argument was what they'd say. And, and it's also internal, intra as well as inter, I think, wanting to find this, like what we think is the character or the story or the humanity or the, the honour and justice and, and we are all different. And there are times when... You have to either be humble or realise that your opinion is is going away from the story that the rest of people, the other, the company or the show or other people are telling, um, and that's that's such a communal realisation at that point in yourself as well as um, you know the excitement of finding something that people might not grasp yet, and it's so the give and take is. I think that the goriest thing is probably the isolation in your mind when <laughs> no one wants to follow you. <laughs> or you're just trying and trying and trying <laughs> as a performer to, 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 to hit the mark of where the, where the director or where the show wants to go. <laughs> Good point. Uh, Isabella, you look like you want to contribute. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I can't remember who first said this to me, but I find it really useful when um, I might be in a position where I'm really convinced and confident in my perspective of something that perhaps, like Michael said, isn't matching the, the story or the arc of what the whole company is trying to say. Um, and it's um, fight rightly, let go lightly, and that, of you know, pick your fights, learn when it's pivotal, learn when it's... Um, and I still, like, get it wrong all the time. <laughs> but I think it's something that I'm constantly fine-tuning about, like, how important is this? How fundamental is this to my character, to the story, to the arc? Um, is picking up my phone really going to be that important right now? <laughs> or something like that. So I find that quite a useful little thing to chant in my head sometimes. <laughs> nice. Thanks, Isabella. Fiona, how about for you? Have you ever been in a situation where you've got a vision for the character but the director has other ideas? A lot of the work that I do uh, is actually, especially of late, 
um, is very culturally specific. And so um, when you cast a Chinese person in a Chinese role and perhaps the director and other people in the on the creative team do not come from a similar background. You know, I come from, I have an experience, a lived experience about the world that the director may not have. And so a lot of it, uh, sometimes the tussle or just is just about explanation and understanding. Like they, you know, perhaps a director doesn't, doesn't, uh, wouldn't automatically assume that you would react a certain way or a character in this context would react in a certain way. And, uh, and so I've had a lot of discussions where I would say, no, a Chinese person would feel this and they would never, they would never, uh, they would never speak with this sort of attitude or um, they would approach it from this sort of thing, from this uh, sort of background. So there's often um, a lot of discussion about that. I was just going to say that a bit like um, running a country, you know, building a play has got to be a democracy but with a strong and clever leader who can ultimately, you know, be, be graceful in hearing the electorate but ultimately make decisions. <laughs> <laughs> we all like to feel we're being heard and a good director will um, acknowledge and hear but will ultimately do what is right for the piece. And, and, and to be honest, you know, that they're in that position to find and, and, and create the best possible version of that, of that piece of text and, and they've, they've been handed that responsibility and so ultimately they have to deliver it and ultimately they have to hone it into something that's cohesive, that represents potentially everyone in the cast, but may not necessarily be able mm. to do that. Um, I think most directors work with, with great compassion towards actors, really. I mean, we've probably all had some terrible experiences and, and those of us who are a little older have probably had more than others. But <laughs> definitely I think these days the conduct of directors and anyone empowered in a given room really acts with with terrific grace and integrity towards most actors. I think it's a pretty loving and inviting space most of the time. Louise, did you have something to add? Yeah, look, I think I, I agree with Nadine on a lot of that. I mean, I think also, you know, times have changed considerably in, you know, the period of time that I have worked as an actor. There's been, um, you know, other rules and regulations brought in to protect actors in a in a more uh, collaborative, generous fashion than possibly in the way in which it was when I first started. You know, the director was kind of, you know, the head of a military sort of <laughs> endeavour, you know, and you, you did as you were told. I mean, I think, you know, the more... The, 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 the more centred, more, the more stable the director is in themselves, the less they need to prove their own ability and the less they need to, the less they need to stamp all over the production that it was them that was the director. Um, so I mean, I think, I think you know, when you're in a room with somebody who's really capable at the job, they have a way of making you feel exceptional, and that's the best possible place for you to create work of of real greatness because then you feel confident and supported and encouraged and loved. I mean, there's no good you're going into a room and feeling frightened. Who's, nobody's going to create anything wonderful when you're feeling frightened. I mean, I would prefer to think that I would go into a room and be celebrated for what that director cast me for originally. I mean, I think it says more about the director than it does about me if you're finding it difficult. <laughs> mm. Now, it's good that you mention generosity and collaboration because that brings us to our next question from Janine, which is about auditions. What has been your most memorable audition? <laughs> I remember I, I did go into an audition once um, thinking I understood the character, thinking I'd understood the play, the themes, everything, and I was, you know, confident in it. Had gone in, done the audition, left, and then received a call saying that um, <laughs> I had I was the only one who had done it that way be because I'd missed something quite vital. <laughs> <laughs> as part of the um <laughs> and um but I ended up booking it because it was a different perspective and um I don't know but that, that I think that's lucky I don't think that happens all the time <laughs> ha. hey how about you Louise I have a story that 
went badly but ended well, so to speak. Um, I auditioned and was consequently the member of the cast of a, a very successful um, television series shot um, some many years ago called Janus for the ABC, a wonderful, wonderful experience. And it was a program that was investigating um, uh, gangland killings during that period uh, through the legal, uh, the justice system within Victoria. And I was auditioning for the magistrate. There was five lead roles and I was auditioning for the magist the female magistrate on that. And they'd done a round of auditions and it was, you know, every man and his dog was going for these roles. I mean, it, it, wherever you lived, you wanted one of these roles. It was so beautifully written by Alison Nacelle and it had this hugely important production team and it was just a very prestigious possibility as an actor to be involved with and I was determined to get that role and um, so the, when they did the second round I was called in again by this stage of course you're absolutely frantic with nerves and uh, I got a few ins on where they were thinking the character might go just on the down low, and went into the magistrate's court, which was then in Russell Street, and um, observed some of the magistrates at the time. And one of the women who was um, to be one of the inspirations um, was Linda DeSau, who's now um, our governor. Um, and so I went and watched her, and she was she was just fabulous. I mean, fabulous, but also a very slick dresser. And so I decided to borrow a um, suit, a, a formal business suit with a fabulously tight skirt and be as slick and fabulous as I possibly could be. And in doing so, um, this is quite personal, but nonetheless, it's part of the story. Um, to get a non-pant line in the skirt, I wore a G-string underwear um, so that it would be, you know, everything would look fabulous. So I went into the room and was completely startled. It's like going into a commercial theatre audition where there's just like a zillion people and nobody had warned me or any other actor that the room would be full of, as I remember it, probably about 12 people, which included, you know, the head honchos at the ABC, several of the producers, the writer, etc., cetera, it's directors, etc., etc., etc. And it, it's really alarming in a television environment to have that happen. So I, I walked in and, whoa, and, uh, you know, the pulse rates up. And they said, you know, do you, do you want to do a bit of a read? Let's see where we sit with this. And I saw, oh, there's a desk and there's a chair. Not realising that the chair had not been locked off. It was a spinning chair. And so I thought, oh, I'm just going to make a beeline for that chair. And then they said, would you like to just put it down? And I'm quite like that. So I said, yeah, let's do that. Let's not rehearse. Let's just go for it. So with that, I made the entrance across the room and walked boldly towards the desk and the desk chair and kind of very casually flopped myself back into the chair, which then proceeded to tip backwards <laughs> and take me with it. And in doing so, what it did was it completely tipped me over, pulling the skirt up uh, beyond my bum. And so I landed down on the ground, pinned by the chair with my bottom sitting up above the desk in front of the 12 people who were auditioning me. And I couldn't get out. So the producer, <laughs> the producer came over to me and leant down and just said to me, hmm, you've made an interesting choice. You see, this is a comedy. And I thought to myself, well, that's the end of this job. I was so humiliated. I did the scene. I went and got into the car and I immediately rang my agent in Sydney and I just started sobbing and said, you have to get me another audition. And two days later, I got the job. So it just goes to show. Yeah, it goes to show auditions are tough. 
It's an honest, sobering, uh, and very real story. Thanks, Lou. And it kind of moves us along perfectly to our next question, uh, which is from Danielle. Uh, and it goes to craft as well as stamina. And the question is when you're performing eight times a week, how do you balance consistency and not let the show become repetitive? Fiona. For me, it's just, it's all about the connection you have with your fellow actors. And um, because the, there are the things that you you have to do, you have to hit your mark, you have to be at in this certain position facing a certain way or you have to hit a certain note, pass them a prop. But what what I love so much is that, uh, you know, the energy that passes between two, you know, you and the person paying your brother or your husband or whatever on the, on any given night, it, it can be so different. And so that's like I always just rely and trust on uh, on my fellow cast members to really like pull me into this is the moment tonight, you know, oh, you're looking a little different tonight or, um, oh, you, oh, you had to rub your eye. Um, oh, you found this moment particularly enjoyable and, and that delights me. So that makes me react a certain way. That leads perfectly. Thank you, Fee. It leads perfectly to our next question, which so many people are interested to know. Uh, I'm sure you've been asked to delight each of you. Um, the question is, how do you learn your lines? I suppose it's one of those wonders of nature. Every actor has a different story. Every actor tries a different methodology. Do you write it down? Uh, do you pace? Do you walk the beaches, walk the streets at night? I remember uh, the actor Colin Moody saying to me that he just reads the play from beginning to end over and again in the dressing room before each show. Michael, I'm going to throw to you for this one. What's your technique? It, it, it again, it, it sounds kind of evasive, but it really depends on the show. Um, you know, if you've got a heightened verse or or um, structured text, um, you can find uh, a lot of rhythm or a lot of isolated work in yourself. Um, if you've got a new work with the playwright in the room, um, it's great to be able to find it and and let it go and explode it out and see what comes. Um, so it's more about the arcs of the scene um, rather than the, the lines themselves and finding the intention within you, kind of learning that or making sense of that. So you mentioned like Colin Moody reading the, the, the play from start to end, very much so. You, I mean, at the end of the day, your job is to walk on stage, say your lines and don't bump into the furniture. And um, I, I've always kind of loved that because that's that's what the audience gets. But between you getting booking a gig and that moment there is so much and there is so much you can do and what helps you helps and what doesn't doesn't um and 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 for me it's yeah it's yeah it changes <laughs> <laughs> that's a great uh, link thank you thank you michael uh and it connects beautifully to our next question which comes from toby who asks, uh, and it's essentially about liveness, about being in the moment, what's your most memorable moment on stage? Is it corpsing, missed cues, forgotten props? Isabella? Given that everybody is okay, I always find it hilarious when people fall over. <laughs> 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 like, given they're fine. Um, <laughs> it just... Like if you've been asleep, if you've not been paying attention or you've just zoned out, it always brings you back in because it's the immediate sense of uh, what, what do I do? <laughs> um, I remember in a, in a production of Hamlet, I was playing Laertes and um, it was the uh, grave scene when we were we bury Ophelia and it's a very dynamic moment and, and it was, you know, Hamlet is couching a while in the corner and it's, you know, it's a good line to use when no one comes. And Claudius is meant to come out ahead of the, the funeral procession and then, and then has this speech and recites the, the few words that are given to a burial. And Claudius didn't arrive. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so there was this, this moment where the stage, just the solemn procession without the person that was going to run the proceedings. And, uh, and so we just kind of stood there for a bit and then <laughs> I just hopped into the grave and said goodbye, and <laughs> and then this, and then you know the, the show 
kept on going and Hamlet and I had a bit of a biff and then Claudia's just kind of came from the shadows in the background <laughs> and watched Red a space. Um, Thanks, Michael. All right, we have one final question before we have to wrap things up, and it's about superstition. I know, don't be alarmed. It's okay. You're in the safety of your own homes. Many people wonder about theatrical superstition. Is it the Scottish play, all the various things you're meant to do if you hear mention of that play, or rituals that you actually might have? Do you (laughs) have a personal superstition? Is it wearing odd socks, perhaps? Carrying a lucky pen into rehearsal, Isabella. I don't think so. I mean, I brush my teeth before I go on stage. <laughs> That's like a steadfast ritual. <laughs> um, no, I don't, I don't think I have any superstitions, personally. How about you, Nadine? I have become very, very superstitious about having fishermen's friends before I perform, which can be <laughs> very diabolical when you've run out. I've been known to have desperate moments flushing between actors' dressing rooms who I've given packets to to say, have you got any spare? <laughs> um, just because they give you this kind of beautiful, clear kind of sense of your nasal and throat cavity and I've become a bit addicted to that and I link it to being ready for performing, which is dumb. But I also like to do a bit of qigong too, so I like to have a sense of being really embodied and if I don't get that time, I feel like, oh, I haven't really done what needs to be done. Yeah, so I do have a few superstitions, unfortunately. I don't think they're my strength. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you would call this a superstition, but um, I don't, and I also think that this is something about my age because um, I used to, I, I used to very easily, you know, be able to get myself warmed up and mentally prepared to go on stage. But I think um, in the last few years, you know. Um, for every, you know, every piece I've done, you know, there's been a particularly tricky or long piece of dialogue, like, you know, especially in Golden Shield, which was full of long, long, very complicated sentences. But there will be certain, uh, there'll be certain key phrases that I feel that I need to have stood on stage and delivered, um, you know, just to have, to have articulated in my mouth. And, um, and so that's, de- I need to definitely have done that. And if I, if, you know, if there have been the handful of times when there hasn't been time or the stage hasn't been available to me to do that. I've just spent the whole play worrying about when I when I get to that line, I haven't, you know, I haven't, I'm not ready for it, that, that I would stuff it up. Um, I didn't stuff it up, but it's still something that I, I need to do. Uh, thanks so much, Fiona. That's a really beautiful way to end because you're actually talking about craft. We forget how physical and emotional the work we do is, and that's a really beautiful summation. But, of course, it is time to end. Thanks to all of you. We have to wrap things up. Uh, It's been a delight to chat with you all. Uh, Stay safe, keep well, and I look forward to seeing you all back in the building very soon. Thank you. Thank you. you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Backstage Banter, supported by our major partner, ANZ. Thanks for joining us, and thank you again to everyone who sent questions in in advance. If you'd like to discover more about what goes on backstage here at Melbourne Theatre Company, be sure to head to our website at mtc.com.au. My name's Chris Mead. Thanks for joining us.